In this episode, we speak with Anna Clark all about how to fit a square peg in a round hole. Yes, we're talking about standards-based grading and rigid gradebook programs and policies. Interesting, John. Uh, Anna is with us and she's starting just her second year and is currently teaching eighth grade. Uh, together, we develop a plan for her to take all of her formative assessment data she's been collecting and finding a way to fit it into her district grading program and policies. Stick around so you can learn how as well. This is another Math Mentoring Moment episode where uh, we speak with a member of the Math Moment Maker community, a person just like you, who is working through problems of practice, and together we brainstorm possible next steps and strategies to overcome them. All right, John, let's do this. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are two math teachers from MakeMathMoments.com who together... With you, the community of math moment makers worldwide who want to build and deliver problem-based math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense-making, and ignite those teacher moves. Welcome, my friends, to another Math Mentoring Moment episode. These are some of mm -hmm. our favorite episodes because we get to bring a fellow math educator just like you onto the show and uh, we get to shake that shoe mm. and try to uh, <laughs> just shake that pebble right out of there. Uh, and today we've mm -hmm. got a really great conversation uh, that may have crossed your mind before about standards-based grading and the district policies, or maybe even just the, the grade book program that you're mm -hmm. using. How do I take those two things, bring them together in a way that feels seamless and meaningful for my students? and for my daily routine. Yeah, and in what I what I loved about our conversation with Anna is is just her her eagerness to make this work for herself and and reaching out to us and you know being her second year of teaching and already realizing that her grading policies had to shift and morph. Mm -hmm. Kyle, I I don't I don't I think we've said it here on the podcast lots of times but I think it wasn't in, you know, it wasn't until at least 10 years in for us where we're like, ah, oh, this is just not jiving the way I need it to with the beliefs I've had and the changes I've made in my classroom, you know, lessons. How do I've now got to figure out a way how to how to morph this into something that is useful for the students and for me. And you know, her doing it in her second year is amazing. So super excited for her. Can't wait for her to uh continue her teaching journey. And uh, really looking forward to checking in with her later. Yeah, I love it, John. And uh, something that really resonated with me, uh, this was when uh, she had filled out the application over at makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor uh, to come on and chat with us about this. Uh, she was mentioning in there, and, and this is right from that little uh, blurb she had. She said, appreciate y'all and love everything you do. The reason I did, you're the reason I didn't give up on education after my first year. So uh, that comment right there obviously Ooh. gives us that energy to continue doing this work. Um, this is the work that, you know, and, and I guess the help that we wish we had uh, along mm -hmm, the way, mm -hmm, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so glad that we have some more new teachers coming out of pre-service, hopping right in there and really looking to the internet, to podcasts like this one in this community, the Make Math Moments community, um, to help them along and help them, I, I guess, really like make the like changes that took you and I like over a decade to make ourselves or at least to get on that journey. So bravo to Anna mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, friends. I think you're going to love this conversation. So uh, let's not waste any time, right, John? We're going to hop in. Let's do it. Hey there, Anna. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. Uh, we are excited to chat with you. So thanks again. Yeah, I'm so glad you all could talk to me. Yes, absolutely. We are super excited to uh, uh, engage in another Math Mentoring Moment episode. I know that this episode is going to be coming out well after everyone's school years have begun, but uh, John and I actually 
are uh, just in our second week of the new school year as we mm-hmm, record this. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, things are crazy in our world. I'm sure things are crazy in your world. I believe you started a little earlier than we did, but uh, fill us in and let us know, Anna, uh, where are you coming to us from? Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe give us a little bit of background on your your teaching role, maybe how many years you've been in teaching, that sort of thing, just to give everyone a little bit of context here. All right. So I'm coming from Birmingham. Alabama area. Um, We've been in school for, I guess, about six weeks now. This is only my second year teaching, and I am teaching eighth grade math, which for us in Alabama, that's pre-algebra, and then I teach one advanced course that's like algebra one, basically. Got it. Um, it. Yeah, so that's, that's where I am. Super awesome cool. stuff. Yeah. Uh, second year teacher. Yeah, remember, congratulations remember the, for yeah. making it through the first. That is the Thanks. toughest one. <laughs> It of is. all so congratulations to you and to stick it out and, yeah. and to keep coming back so amazing stuff anna uh or anna um hey we've got to ask you this you know if you've li- you've listened before to this ep- you know this podcast so we ask everybody their math moments so fill us in on your math moment when we say math class what just pops into your mind as this memory that has just stuck with you all these years fill us in on the details what is your math moment So I think of math class as three different stages in my life, all the way up until about seventh grade. I was always super good at math, made a hundred on every test. Just like if somebody saw the nerd in the class, it was me. And then I had some rough stuff go on in my life at home and I hit geometry and made my first C ever in Mm. my life. And from there, all through the rest of high school, everything just sort of went downhill. And I felt like I never really got math ever again, kind of because like that, that memorization part of my brain, I guess, stopped working because of some personal stuff that happened. Um, And then, you know, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to teach yet, but I started in college with elementary education and then I started tutoring. I was like, well, I can at least tutor elementary schoolers because I was good at elementary school math. And then I realized I was actually better at teaching math than I was learning math. So I kept tutoring higher and higher grades and I was getting better grades on my own tests by helping other people. So I made it to college and had my first Um, just introduction to an inquiry based class Mm. and it happened to be geometry which was the class that I had you know done horribly and for the first time I'd taken it and it was it was a very difficult way to learn math for me but it it challenged me in the best ways and I went from just being good at math to falling in love with math to being you know, instead of trying to memorize all the proofs, I was proving them myself. Mm. Um, And it, it all stuck so much better. And I had a 100 again in that class by the time I finished it. And from that moment, I was like, I'm just going to teach math. Like I've I've changed my major. I went through Mm. all of the other inquiry based math courses that I could before it became so high level. It was just straight social knowledge, just teaching. Um, But yeah, that's, that's awesome. my math moment. Was that geometry How class? How cool is that? What an interesting story. So to come from that, you know, oftentimes it's like an either or, right? Someone has mm-hmm. either like a really, you know, negative experience with math, or maybe they had a, you know, what they felt was a positive experience. It sounds like yours felt positive up to a point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I sort of heard my own story in yours a bit there in that uh, kindergarten through grade seven journey where you know, the memorization was probably sort of like kind of keeping you going. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you mentioned something too, though, about how, you know, you had some things going on in your home life or in in your, your personal life, some Mm -hmm. challenges and, you know, it, and then you came full circle and managed to not just sort of walk away and say, I'm not a math person. I can't do this and Mm -hmm. never Mm -hmm. tried again, but managed to sort of like come out on top, which, I feel is such a rare situation, right? So for you to kind of, you know, come from a place of feeling good about it and then maybe not so great about it and then sort of like revisiting it and looking at it in a different way, I'm got to know like how, if, if you feel, did that impact or influence what you're doing as an educator with your students here in your second year? So I realized just how detrimental just lecturing Mm. to people was and how that was only going to get, you know, 20 to 30% of my kids 
Um, and having started teaching just a year after the pandemic really took a toll everywhere, um, the kids came back to school just unwilling to put in any work because they've kind of had, at least in my district, two free years where they were just kind of given a pass. Um, nobody failed those two years because why would we fail kids if we're having to teach them stuff at home? So they came back with that attitude. They're not going to fail me. So I'm not going to do anything. Right. Um, so that was difficult. And so it became just a challenge of every day, every single day, how am I going to get them to engage with the math themselves so that one, they have to be engaged in order to learn it. And two, it actually sticks. And it's not me just hitting those maybe 20 to 30 people that would get it with memorization and you know the other people that wouldn't get it immediately it didn't come to them naturally weren't putting in the effort anymore so i had to go past their lack of effort and Mm. spark curiosity (laughs) (laughs) and what what would you if you think about if you think about like your classroom and you and you think about some of the effects like what do you what do you think is happening how would you describe how the kids are reacting to the, to the lessons? Like you've described, like, you know, we might capture 20% if we lectured. Um, Have you seen, have you seen this change in kids attempting work? Uh, We know when, when you mentioned COVID, I think we all kind of like nodding our heads, like, yeah, we've been teaching through that, you know, COVID, you know, brought out bad habits or a loss of habits. Like we Mm -hmm. just lost some habits of, of, of things. We have to like bring those back. So I'm wondering like, when you implemented this kind of style of teaching that that you're, you know, you're hooked on to sparking curiosity as well, what have you seen in the students to react to that style of lesson? So my students that are good at memorizing will leave and say I'm the worst teacher ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> because they're they're finally being challenged. And it's not just let me write something down and study it 500 times and I'll remember it. Um, but I did catch a few of them who are, you know, they're in my accelerated course, my advanced mm-hmm. class. They've been told they're good at math their whole lives. And I caught them one day last year when they complained about why wouldn't I just teach? Well, about five minutes later, they were ranting about how they didn't remember anything that they had learned mm-hmm. ever in math class ever. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, wait, so you're telling me that the way you want me to teach doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And um, so that, I've, I've caught them in that. And then I've got other students that, you know, I've given them a hands-on, if you will, approach to algebra for the first time in their life. Like maybe they've seen a number line before. I realized when I was trying to like help some of them with integers, that some of them have never seen integers on a number line. And that got me very worried. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> so some of them are getting this for the first time and they're like, why do I like math now? Like what's different about your class? They can't quite put a finger on it other than mm-hmm. they know, like I'm mm-hmm. not like they work in groups and they talk to each other a whole lot more. Um, but they can't figure out why it just works in their brain now. So I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. What a cool, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I hope people who are listening who may have run into a similar challenge with, you know, students often are, you know, the the students who have been traditionally strong because of memorization or because, you know, they haven't had to do much of the thinking. They've just done a lot of this sort of mimicking. Um, oftentimes they do push back because it is harder. Like the reality right. is, is you're creating a productive struggle. And right. as humans, we tend to not like having struggle, right? Like I don't like struggle. Uh, but I know it's good for me, you know, like, so it's right. one of those things. And I, I've mentioned it on an episode, I'm sure of it, um, where when I go to workshops, for example, and I'm participating where it's not John or I leading the workshop and I'm actually like the participant, when, as soon as they ask me to like do something, I'm like, sort of like, ah, I don't want to. <sighs> yeah. But then once I get going, it's like you, it, you know, you're like drawn into it. And it's such an interesting mm-hmm. sort of like um, mindset or maybe habit. It's like maybe just a bad habit where, you know, we don't want to actually do that thinking. So it's great that you caught them there. It's also great that you didn't um, second guess, I guess, too badly where you wanted to right. revert to maybe more of a lecture style, because mm-hmm. I know that there's teachers who have been teaching for 20 years. 30 years. And when they make changes like you're trying to do, 
when students push back, they tend to sort of go back really quickly, right? right? They don't want to get everybody upset and, you know, sort of ruffle feathers. So um, that is huge. So anyone who's listening, you know, definitely can like consider those things when students don't necessarily enjoy or, or they kind of push back and they say things like, you're not teaching or, you know, like, why don't you just teach us the way everybody else does? Like that can really- Why won't you just tell us what to do? Yes, exactly. (laughs) That can really, really, um, you know, hinder your, you know, your psychological mindset on like where, you know, where your lessons are going and whether you're doing the right thing for students. So good on you for, uh, for continuing that, uh, that journey with your students. So, um, I think we're getting closer to why we're on the line here today. And I'm wondering, do you mind sharing with us? Like what's on your mind lately? What is that pebble in your shoe that we might be able to shake out together as a, uh, as a group here? Right. So I'm trying to foster a, an environment that making mistakes is okay. Um, And I want them to always, you know, be risk takers and try and, um, you know, give it their best effort the first time so that they don't feel like I have to show them what to do. They can make a mistake and it's okay. So with that, I know that standards based grading is like a really great way of doing this of, you know, um, just like having them focus on let's learn this. Let's not just get a grade or get a mark and move on. And that's the Mm -hmm. end of the world. Um, But the struggle that I have is our district is not a standards-based grading district. Um, Mm -hmm. We have very strict guidelines for like, they call them gold, silver, bronze. Gold grades are 60% of your grade and they are tests and projects. Mm -hmm. Um, Silver grades are homeworks, quizzes, classworks, and then bronze grades are supposed to be what they call soft skills. So they get a grade for like bringing their supplies to class and whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So where I struggle is how can I, you know, do standards-based grading and really focus on this, like other than just letting them retest on things, how can I kind of find a loophole in this prescription um, to do what I would like to do? And have you, have you tried uh, anything yet? You know, like you, you, you realize that you, you want to uh, evaluate and, and, and assess with standards as the, as the kind of the benchmarks. Um, but you've got this rigid, you know, uh, put a mark in here, put a mark in here. We've got a, a category. I have to that, have, yeah, yeah, we, I have to have three tests. I have to have yeah. six. Yeah. You know, there's numbers I have to get. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Have you, have you kind of dabbled yet or, uh, uh, I'm curious to hear what you've, you've done for your dabbling or <laughs> are you still just being like, I haven't tried anything yet. Cause I'm, I'm kind of waiting to see how it all fits together. Let us, let us know what, what have you, what your dabbling is so far. <laughs> so I've, I've done one dabble, I guess. Um, <laughs> I've done, I read building thinking classrooms this summer and just jumped all in with that. Um, so I've loved that book and I've loved seeing like all the different pieces that I've been able to pull in, even if some stuff isn't like a hundred percent what Peter would like. Um, but I tried his like walking around with a clipboard basically and assessing one student at a time, giving them check marks and then using a code to say like, they got this in group work. I put a little G by their check mark or I put an X if they're like, they can't do this even if it's a group, even if I help them. I put a check mark and put an H if they need help. So I'm keeping track of all of that. I just can't, I say can't, I, I haven't yet figured out how to translate that into a number mm, um, and actually put it in a grade book that parents are checking weekly and emailing me saying, why don't I have any grades mm-hmm. in the past and, two weeks? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just to clarify, I'm sort of getting the sense that, you know, your grade book is something that pretty immediately parents and students can see. So if you enter right. it in, mm-hmm. they get immediate sort of access to it or they, they the visibility is there. So to they speak. get a notification if I... Like Look at it that. It notifies their phone if I put a grade in. They're right. they're at the dinner table and they get the notification of little Johnny's uh, test performance. Yep. Uh, <laughs> interesting. What? What, Anna, what I'm just thinking about this prescribed system that you have, I'm, and I'm thinking about, you know, the way that we've been doing our grading uh, for assessment, um, uh, really for assessment for growth for the last few years. And I'm I'm curious about 
the actual mechanics of what you're working with. Like when you're saying the system and, and you put the into the grade book, um, like for example, uh, could you create if you wanted now, don't, you're not going to go do this, but could you create a thousand tests in that grade book and put a mark for each one for the semester? Like, like why are you saying a thousand is because I'm just trying to gauge like how much flexibility you have in like tests. You said 60% of their grade is calculated by tests and projects, but I'm wondering is like, could you just pump in a whack of them and there's oh, no yes. limit? You can oh, yeah. like every time um, it's like, I want to create a new test and then boom, there's a test in there. And I just, I can put marks in that kind of thing. That's what I'm picturing. Yes. So I just, I can create whatever I want to. My principal, however, will say, why do you have this many things? Because lots of teachers, math teachers figured out the math behind it and realized they could change the percentages if they wanted to by mm -hmm. like putting stuff in. Cause the percentages are automated by okay. our um, learning It'll, system or whatever. Right. Um, so they figured out like, well, if I just oh, I'll put, put like any five of these here, one things here and right. Yeah. Or if I say this one is 50 points instead of a hundred points, then it like, right. so they awesome. told us you have to have this many, you have to make it out of a hundred points. Right. And so I'm yeah. wondering, I'm wondering if, and I'm sure, I'm sure since it's unlimited and, and you can make whatever you want in there, um, having, what are your thoughts on having a conversation with your administrator before you start, you know, dabbling some more uh, with the system? Because I'm, I'm, I'm just picturing if you, so, something that Kyle and I uh, learned, uh, not learned, but kind of it was nice to re get reaffirmed is we were talking with Tom uh, Shimmer about you know assessment and standards based grading, and he, mm -hmm. he had this great line that kind of was like it was like a wake up call to everybody, but it was almost like everyone's everyone's doing this, but it's like, you're not calling it, but you are really, he said, like, if you're not, you know, if you're not grading or assessing by standards, like what the heck are we doing? Right. right? Like, are, are, we, are we, are we grading? We, anyway? right? Are we grading by like, <laughs> like, is the whole mark, um, you showed up mm -hmm. today and you get, you know, 10, 10 marks just because you were on time and you wrote your name. No, you're, you're grading and you're assessing kids by how well they're doing on these standards. So, so we are all kind of doing that. Um, it's just, I think what happens is how, how we enter it in the system. So I guess why I'm asking you questions about your system is because it's possible that you could enter, um, instead of like test one from unit one quiz one, you could possibly start to rename these by mm -hmm. standard. So you could say, instead of test one, you might say, look, uh, in unit one, I have, you know, six overall standards or five overall standards that I'd like to assess mm -hmm. for students. And I'd like to, that to be ongoing. So it's possible that while, while you're, you know, using your check marks, you're telling your parents, you're telling your administrators that these numbers I might put in the system, they might change over time. Like, like the calculations mm -hmm. are going to fluctuate because I'm seeing different things and I'm using different evidence, but in in your like sixty percent, you could have the overall standards as a as listed out there. Now that might be by the end of the course, you know, twenty five or mm -hmm. twenty or you know, it might be ten. Mm -hmm. um, so think about what are the outcomes that you want to assess. What are the things you want to give feedback on mm -hmm. for your students, and then those could be the tests that are currently tests, and then those numbers can change. And so mm -hmm. now when you change them, it's like you've seen more evidence. Um, you know, you could do the same thing with quizzes um, in your classwork. So you can still fit these things in. It's just how I think you look at what those numbers now mean. Right. So like we're required to have three tests. I don't know that we're allowed to have like a whole more than a whole lot more than that. Um, but one thing I realized that power school does is it breaks down. Like I can actually select standards when I make an assignment, like there's mm -hmm. a separate mm -hmm. tab so I can still make it like my 100 point test that it has to be. And then I go over to this next tab and it says standards. Then I click all the standards that align with the test. And then when I go to grade the test, I can put a letter grade. I can't put like an 88. It could be A, B, C, D, F. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm already using that a little bit for the bigger, you know, tests and quizzes that do grade like multiple standards. Um, and, you know, I'm showing them, I've already had a conversation with, my parents and my students and there's a little button that I can push on. Like when I enter the grade that says incomplete, that says, look, your kid 
has a whole lot more potential for growth here. I'm putting incomplete because I want you to know this is not where the grade is going to stay. We're going to keep working on this. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. So I think like maybe that's the best I can do right now with the prescribed numbers and percentages and such. Well, it. I mean, what I'm hearing is that your head is in the right place. So like when you say it's like the best you can do, it's like, I'm hearing that you're doing a great job already. Like you already are considering these things and that's amazing. My second year of teaching, I was like, how do I, you know, just grade these things and get them back? Like I had no, you know, I had no idea that there was like another way to, you know, to sort of look at it or, or think about things. Or so, use it, you know, use it for right. a particular purpose. It was yeah. just a number to put in a system and get back. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and I guess my curiosity is, and, and you might not have a straight answer for this, but I'm wondering, uh, or maybe like a, a full answer or, or an, a, a complete answer, but I'm wondering like, if you were to sit down with your administration and you were to have a conversation, would they be for or against, you know, you had mentioned there's pretty sort of, it sounds like strict guidelines on like how many tests you can have and those types of things. How, how, what would they say if you were, you were going to, let's say, put in a mark for a test, which is related to these standards and a student was to show you later that they actually are are actually in a better place with their understanding related to those standards and that mark was to actually change what well, i don't do think they do? would even notice that that hap that would, would happen so mm -hmm. but but i guess yeah. like if you were to tell them like hey this is what i want to do mm -hmm. um would they be okay with that idea or would they be like well no you've already like put it in the system you know, and I guess the question I I'm I'm wondering is like how dynamic can this grade book be, or how static is this book? Like how permanent is this book? I don't um, think they mind it changing because um, it's I'm already doing that for students that have IEPs and 504s that get to retest anyways. Right. Got um, it. So they're and they also with the RTI that we do they know that a lot of those kids that are on tier three are going to have to retest anyways. Got so, it. Okay. So, so it okay sounds like, like, it sounds like, and, and I think there's kind of two places that you can be as well. Like, so you've got this sort of formal grading system. It's going to have to be set up in a pretty particular way. Mm -hmm. However, there's some flexibility in terms of like the, the grades, like when they get in there, my biggest concern mm -hmm. in the back of my mind was if you put a grade in there, is that sort of like cemented and therefore nothing can change. It sounds like there is some flexibility. There's right. also on the other side too, that not all of your assessment data has to be reflected in the grade book. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it won't influence the grade book, but what I mean is that you could have, let's say another sort of, you know, system where you're collecting like more between you and students I mean, that's what a grade book's supposed to do, but sadly, mm -hmm. it sounds like, you know, here you're sort of stuck in a, in a particular system or, or, um, you know, um, uh, approach probably just for consistency sake, uh, mm -hmm. at the school or district level, but over here, you could have things broken down a little bit more deeply mm -hmm. where students could still see, and it might not get recorded in the system that grade in the system could change based on what's happening here. So it could be something as simple as a checklist. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a, a, a digital checklist, whether it's like a spreadsheet or uh, Google Slides. I know mm -hmm. John's been playing with like portfolio since fresh grades being ripped away from him. Uh, you know, they're, they're closing down shop. So John's experimenting with some other methods. So, you know, kind of keeping your, your eyes and ears and mind open to the possibility that you you could have like something that is more standards based grading like in the traditional sense or i guess in the more recent sense and then what comes out of there is sort of your result that you want to put in the grade book and when there's a big change you modify the grade book mm -hmm. and then mom and dad get you know the notification at dinner time versus you know changing things every day you know all day mm -hmm. long Right. So like having an unofficial and then just altering it when it's like a substantial right. enough change. Yeah. 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 And yeah, like, like, to like be you, you honest, could... it's like almost like more official in your world, right. like, but not yeah. in the district's world. That's what right? I was going like, right. 
that's what I was going to say is it's that it's, it, it's really like, think of it, think of it. Like if you had a, sh- you know, I'm just, I'm just, you know, spitballing here, but if you had a page, mm-hmm. you know, and that page had, you know, st- you know, was particular, well, you could go by learning outcome or you could go by student mm-hmm. and you could say like, this is, the, you know, so-and-so's page here's like four learning goals and where are they at this point? You could have anecdotal you know, notes that you've mm-hmm. made. Um, you could even like just have like stars that you're filling in on yeah. and those stars have like success criteria attached for that particular learning goal. Like if I see this, then I know that this person is at this you know place on the learning journey for that particular outcome. And it's kind of a, an ongoing track, but, you know, sharing that with the student. Um, remember that the assessment for, you know, assessment is used for growth in the students. It's like, we want to capture evidence and in data, like Kyle said, so that we can, it can inform our instruction so that we can help the kid go on. So I I like what Kyle suggested. It's like, we can do all of this informally here. And this has all my data. And if somebody ever kind of was like, well, why is that number like that? And you're like, look, this is, this is my mark book that actually makes so much sense. I have my students, I have their outcomes. I have where they are on those outcomes. They can see where there are in their outcomes, like have a page. Each of them has a page in their own binders that they can self-assess on those same outcomes. Mm-hmm. It, you know, you have to do a little bit of setting up in advance to, you know, map those outcomes for each other, but that would be your real grade book. And I think, mm-hmm. I think that is, it gets at the purpose of standards-based grading with, and an assessment for growth, which is helping the students along this journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm doing something similar to that. So our textbook is actually, I've like been really proud of our textbook because it has a lot of um, very curious explorations at the beginning. And then it comes in later with all the vocab. So I've loved that. But it also in the teacher edition has like rubrics for self-assessment that breaks down every single learning outcome for me and shows like, you know, a mild, mild, medium, spicy problem that the kids can look at and say, can I do this? So I don't even have to make that for myself. It's just there. They just don't like looking at it because they don't understand the words (laughs) a lot of times. I love Um, it. So I can alter that. Um, Yes. So So it's like, it sounds to me and, and I will turn it back to you to kind of maybe get your, you know, sort of where, where your head's at now. But sometimes I find when we have conversations, not just assessment, but in other areas as well, that, you like that educators are are doing the important parts of an idea, but because it doesn't feel formal, like because maybe that, you know, that grade book, it almost feels like you're taking all of this awesome standards-based work that we're doing over here. And then we have to like, you know, spit it out into this number or letter or something over here that like the work is lost, but really that's just like, that's sort of like the end goal. Like that's just Mm -hmm. sort of like a summary of what's happened. Uh, Is it perfect? It never will be, but really the important work for, for, in our mind anyway, with standards-based grading, as John mentioned, is it's all about helping you figure out where students are, Mm -hmm. ensuring that they know where they are, or at least trying, like you said, sometimes they don't fully understand, like you're trying to communicate that with them. But imagine if we weren't breaking down the learning goals, how, how much more difficult that would be. So it sounds like you've got a pretty good sort of grasp on, on the standards based piece. And then I think for those at home who are listening as well, um, there is never one right way, right? So for you, you might choose to break things down into like, you know, into larger chunks. Other people Mm -hmm. like to have like really small chunks. You really have to go with what makes sense to you at the time. And just know that, you know, next year, five years from now, you're probably going to do it a little differently because you're going to learn along the way and, you know, things will change for you. But ultimately- as a second year teacher. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, like you, you've definitely, you know, made huge, huge uh, shifts compared to Mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. I feel so many educators are. And and honestly, you know, what a great opportunity for you or an advantage you have, because, you know, you're not getting sort of stuck in habits that maybe aren't as productive. So you're, you're getting yourself into really good habits here. And I think for you, it's going to be just continuing to tweak. And again, at the end of the day is, is constantly reflecting with yourself to go, why am I doing standards-based grading anyway? Because I think sometimes we forget to ask ourselves why. Like we know it's good, right? Maybe I read something about it or someone talked about it or you heard someone on the podcast speaking um, positively about it. 
But when we really, when it comes down to it, it's like, why am I doing it? I'm doing it to make sure that I know what I need to teach. And so that students know where they are and what they need to do to get better. And of course, we want to have the opportunity for them to show that growth along the way. And really, there's so many different ways that we can do that. Um, you know, having like a, a system that's set up like in your school or your district, like that doesn't have to be sort of the the thing that, you know, makes or breaks a successful standards-based approach to assessment. Right, right. Yeah, so I think, I guess the biggest pebble is I'm doing all of the work on the one side. So what's the best way to translate that into what parents are used to seeing as a number? Um, like I'm keeping track of which standards they know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'm keeping track even in like our online grid book that parents can see which standards from the state level. It, it won't let me break that into learning outcomes, but I can hit the giant standards and say that's mm -hmm. what we're testing on. Um, so do I like... Is it something that I like make every learning outcome like a certain number of points or like I weight them based on yeah, how important like, they are? You can, you can. Like I would, what I would do is first, you're going to want to set up like that success criteria for those outcomes. So you right. know what to look for. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's important because that's, that's different than to say, just taking the test result and converting it into a number. We're looking for you know consistency on these particular skills. Like if a, a student is getting this, you know, pegged mark, um, it's because I've seen them demonstrate these things, which I've, you know, I've just decided that is, you know, uh, here in Ontario, we might call that a, a level four type of work for that particular learning goal. It means, you know, you're, you're kind of like towards mastery You're you're demonstrating, you know, at, you know, the, the standard or above the standard. So you want to just, I think you're going to want to like, you know, create that success criteria and the different kind of levels mm -hmm. so that you can go, okay, you know, this student is performing around here consistently. Mm -hmm. So that translates into this grade for that uh, outcome. And then that outcome could then translate on your, your tests as well. So mm -hmm. the hardest part is, is, or I guess not the hardest part, but, but I think you're going to, you probably want to do some of that shifting of what the test means in your right. mark book, right? You're probably going to want to redesign it to say like, this is an outcome on this mm -hmm. um, because then you have more flexibility to say, I'm putting that mark in because the, otherwise the test might capture, you know, all of these learning go learning skills. And if, if that's true, then you might be thinking about averaging those learning goal, you know, those learning goals or those outcomes mm -hmm. for that test. Um, Cause that's what, you know, you would have done by a mark you know, a, 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 you know, a modular or a mark system, anybody by giving points or check marks per question right. and then averaging all of those. And that's the test mark. So you could do that by outcome instead. Yeah. I was, I was going to say something like similar to that as well, John, like where, you know, I used to have my unit one test on two variable statistics. And it was mm -hmm. like, really what I was saying without realizing it was all the learning goals related to two variable statistics are under this umbrella. And, you know, back then I never realized it, but, you know, I would make my tests out of about the same number of marks. But if one test was out of 50 and one was out of 40 and I didn't weight them in the grading system, then that one was actually worth more, the one that had more, you know, marks on it. So, right. you know, the reality is, is kind of like when you zoom out on all these learning goals, right? Whether you like having maybe larger or maybe you like, you know, narrowing them down is really looking at them and maybe even creating yourself almost like a couple buckets could be three buckets where there's like, Hey, these bucket, like bucket number one is like really important. You know, like the, mm. these are our spicy learning goals, as you mm -hmm. said before. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to put these ones there. Like I want to make sure students really have that. Here's okay. a bucket that, you know, is kind of important, but you know, maybe not so much. And then over here is like, you know, maybe some of the learning goals that you're always scratching your head going like, did we really need to do that learning goal? Like who wrote mm -hmm. the curriculum? You know, everybody always okay. has a couple of those in there. And, you know, you could do something like that where you go, okay, like, is it really, you know, is it necessary for a student to be as strong in this learning goal as this one? Um, so I, I think one of the big pieces though, is earlier than later in a, in a school year, you want to have that, you know, whatever you decide to organize mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. in terms of waiting, you kind of want to get that done ahead of time, just so you're feeling kind of good about it. And you're not sort of like 
you know, marks aren't changing later because you've sort of varied the, you know, the, uh, mm-hmm, the weight mm-hmm. of them. Right. Um, but, but yeah, just figure out whatever that organizational system is going to be, whether like for me coming from a traditional grading system, I had my old tests. It would be easy for me to go, well, I used to have seven tests, so I'm going to keep, you know, seven chunks of my learning goals and I'm going to break them up that way. Or if they say there's three tests that have to be in this grading system, you could look at all your learning goals and say, well, these learning goals are going to be chunked into test one that I have to put into this grading system. And these ones are going to go into test two. Um, But ultimately at the end of the day, as long as you feel comfortable about, you know, and, and really it's about what matters most to you, what you think matters most in, in your course, um, I think you're going to come out ahead and you're going to, you know, again, there's going to be no right or wrong way to do it, um, but at least you can feel good about having a reason for it. Like there's nothing worse mm-hmm. than doing something and going like, I'm not really sure why I'm doing it this way, but if like you can go, okay, well, I think these ones are more beneficial, so I've weighted them more. Whereas these ones are less so, so I've weighted them less or whatever justification you have, okay. you can feel good about that and be able to articulate it to other people. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome. Awesome. What are you, what are you feeling? What do you, what do you think your next steps are going to be? So we actually have open house on Thursday. So this was like a very well-timed conversation. <laughs> um, I guess it's just making sure my students are, you know, very clear on why I'm grading the way that I'm grading. And then, you know, Thursday night, especially when I see my parents for the first time in person, explaining to them Mm -hmm. why you might get two or three different notifications for the same test. If it's been a month since I put that test in. Right. Um, So I just, I'm glad to know that I'm like on the right track and that I'm not like unnecessarily banging my head against the wall with the, the right. prescribed grading system. It's, it's always great to, you know, hash out or chat uh, ideas with other educators just yes. to feel where you are, feel what's happening, you know, and get re- reconfirmation of, of what you believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm the only person at my school that's trying to do it this way. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's good for yeah. Good on you. It's one, you know, that is a hard uh, sort of, you know, role to to have is is trying to innovate, trying to do things differently. Everybody else is doing something different. Am I doing it right? Am I going to mess this up? Lots of weight on your shoulders. But honestly, I I think your your head's in the right place. One key thing for that conversation with students and parents um, for that open house is again, always coming back to, again, why? Like, why do I want standards-based grading for your for your son or daughter uh, or child is because I want them to do as well as they possibly can in this course. And I want to help them help themselves mm-hmm. succeed. And I feel like when people hear you say that, it's like right away, they're going, okay, like it's, you know, this teacher isn't coming in here to try to make this hard or difficult or, you know, not give my, my child a good experience. Um, I think right away people sort of go, Oh, okay. And, you know, let them know as well. Like if you have concerns, like if there's a challenge, if you're not sure or uncertain, you know, definitely reach out to me, you know, and we can have a conversation. Like when they know that those communication lines are open as well, Mm -hmm. I think it just like lets everybody settle a little bit, you know, people don't like change. It's very scary. Um, but if you can help them feel comfortable and they go, wow, like I can tell just in this conversation that this teacher cares about her students, um, then I, I think people are just w- much more open to to trying something new. Mm-hmm. The, I said this to the kids on the very first day I had them when I was explaining my syllabus and you know what the screening was going to look like. I said, you know, you're going to get a second chance to learn a lot of these topics because if you make an F that's more, I didn't teach you the right stuff and I have more work to do, not you just have an F and that's going to label you for the rest of the school year. Um, so I told mm-hmm. them from day one, the goal is we are going to learn as much as we physically can. And if you get a bad mark, it's because I need to teach you more stuff and keep working with you on it. So awesome. love it. Awesome yeah. stuff. Anna, we, uh, we, we want to thank you for joining us here today and uh, hashing out these ideas and uh, just remind you of a couple of things uh, inside the academy, which we know that you are a member. We have an assessment for growth course. We talk about a lot of these ideas in there. 
Um, make sure you kind of jump in there, go through a few things. We've got some suggestions, especially like how to use portfolios as well to mm -hmm. kind of help kind of round things out. But uh, super glad you joined us. And I'm, I'm uh, excited for your next year and excited to see some of these changes. I'm hoping um, we can revisit this conversation. Um, maybe, hmm, maybe like June, like, like, like May when the end of school year is ending, we yeah. can come back and, uh, follow up and see how things are going. What do you say? I'd love that. Amazing. Awesome. That's fantastic. Well, listen, you are, uh, being vulnerable is hard. You're in mm -hmm. your second year. You're already hopping on the podcast. Um, this is a message for everybody who's listening. If you haven't uh, tried to hop on for a mentoring moment episode, head over to makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. And uh, we're totally loving these conversations. So have yourself an awesome night, Anna, and uh, good luck as you carry on into your second whole year. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a great school year. You too. Chat Take soon. Care. Okay, bye. Well, Math Moment Makers, there you have it. There's Anna, who's doing some pretty awesome stuff, mm -hmm, just going mm -hmm. into year number two, as she had mentioned uh, to us earlier that, uh, you know, the podcast and this community has really helped her uh, along because we know year number one, and actually for me, I remember it being like year is one through five. We're really challenging as you're just trying to figure so many things out. Um, so it was great to have her come on the on the on the podcast. Uh, and I sort of got the sense, John, that you know she was realizing, and I hope she realizes, and and maybe when she re-listens to this episode, if she didn't get that sense, like she's doing a lot of really great things already mm -hmm. in her classroom, and just the way she's thinking about grading and assessing and trying to change things for students, uh, I think is going to go a long way yeah. for her building rapport with students and parents, but also just ensuring that more students realize their fullest math potential. Yeah. And it was, it was, you could see it that she was, she had realized that she had been doing standards-based grading. She, she was using, you know, the assessment data, you know, her evidence, her, what she's witnessed to change her instruction to help students grow to push that forward so it was great for her to make that realization and go oh i i can just try to fit that in over here now because i've already got really the real grade book because i think that's what the grade book that matters for kids and and for her to make that realization was was great in the conversation and uh hey what what is something right now that you know you're doing well, right? Like we all know that we're like doing this, you know, something really great. Um, what is that thing? Like say it out loud. Like you know, right now you're doing something great and, and, and share it, share it. You don't even have to, I guess you don't have to share it with anyone. You just say it like, Hey, I do this pretty good in my classroom. We know you do. Uh, if you want to share it with someone, pull someone aside, just say, say it. John and Kyle told me to say it. So <laughs> I'm saying it, to, saying it to you, but, uh, uh, I think that's an important thing to say is just reflect, uh, think about some of the things that we are doing well in the class, uh, in our, in our classrooms and, and what we're doing in our jobs on a regular basis and not thinking that, you know, I've got this and this and this, that I'm not doing great at reflect on some of the things that you are doing well. I love it. And Hey, if you want to share it with the community, we are on social media at make math moments on all platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, and we even have a free private Facebook group, Math Moment Makers K through 12. So head on over there. But uh, you know what would really fill our hearts is if you took a moment, left us a line or two as a rating and review on your favorite podcasting platform. I know for me, it's Apple Podcasts. Uh, John, I think you've done the shift over to Spotify. Yeah, I'm all Spotify uh, now. Well, look at you. I, I don't know. I don't know if there, we'll have to have a chat about that. I don't know why you've done it but I'm still hanging out with Apple. But whatever podcast hmm. platform you are leveraging in order to listen to this uh, this show, maybe it's on YouTube, uh, give us that one-liner. A rating and review goes a long way, not only to filling our heart, but also ensuring that the uh, crazy algorithms out there, the Google machine uh, will share this resource with more educators just like you.
Hey, and Anna, Anna, when she chatted with us here on this particular episode, she had reached out to us. She went over to makemathmoments.com forward slash mentor. She filled out a form and said, hey guys, I, I really want to hash this idea out. And we brought her on. We brought her on to have a conversation and we would love to speak with you about what pebble is rocking around in your shoe. Um, hmm. if it's, if it's, if it's rolling in there, it's probably rolling in many other teachers shoes. Um, all you got to do is head on over to make mathmoments.com forward slash mentor, fill out a quick form that sends us an email so that we can reach out to you and, and have a chat and, uh, work out what you're going through. We're here to support. Awesome stuff. Hey friends, listen, show notes, links to resources and complete transcripts to read from the web or download and take with you can be found over on the website. Uh, you can access all of the different episodes over on makemathmoments.com in the podcast area. Uh, this episode you can uh, get at makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 201, 201 Whoa. episodes. Uh, but remember, on that home base, we've got all kinds of other awesome stuff. The framework, the three-part framework guidebook you can grab, all kinds of tip sheets, as well as over 50 full units of study that are all problem-based, have math talks, and full teacher guides over on the makemathmoments.com website. Well, my friends, until next time, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. Oh, you thought I forgot, didn't you? And a high five for you.